see you. We're so glad you're worshiping with us tonight, whether you're in person or you're joining us online. We are grateful to gather with you. I'm Jacoby, get to serve on staff here at Kairos, and I would love to continue our worship by reading our text for tonight. Cook is going to come in just a minute and preach for us and um, illuminate God's word, um, and so I'm excited to do that. We're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 31 tonight, so feel free to follow along in your copy of God's word, or it'll also be up on the screens behind me. Before we do that, I'll invite you to go to the Lord in prayer with me. Holy Spirit, would you give us eyes to see, ears to hear? Jesus, would you go before us in this text and make a way? And together we say, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. Jeremiah chapter 31, I'll begin reading in verse 1. At that time declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love, therefore I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again I will build you, and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again you shall adorn yourself with tambourines, and shall go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. Again you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant and shall enjoy the fruit. For there will be a day when watchmen call in the hill country of Ephraim, Arise and go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. And then skipping down to verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Also the word of the Lord has been said. Thanks be to God. This is the word of the Lord. Again, good evening. It is so good to see you all. It's so good to be here. Uh, ladies, thank you so much. It is good to be here uh, in the place and in the shoes of my dear friend, Chris Brooks. It is also a joy to be here with him in the same place. Uh, this is the first time I've been here at Kairos, and he's been here. And so just to be in my brother's presence has been a balm to my soul, and it's been so good to me. Uh, I love that brother dearly and fiercely, and so anytime I get to be here to open God's word for us, it is a joy. And uh, shouts out to all of those of you doing social distancing. We're all in this together. Praise God. Can COVID be over yet? Well, Jeremiah 31 has a lot to do with COVID, uh, whether you know it or not. Um, and in Jeremiah 31, we're introduced to a narrative that is, I think, really, really instructive for us this evening. But before we hop into the actual text, let me ask you a series of questions. One, have you ever been in a wilderness place? Have you ever been in a place of transition? Maybe you're moving from one place to the next place, and maybe your move from one place to the next place is full of uncertainty because you didn't really want to leave the first place, but you kind of had to. Maybe you're in a season of transition and you're feeling like you're in the wilderness because you know you've got to leave a place. You have no clue where you're going or what you're doing. Maybe you've been in a season of hardship, whether that's death or famine. Maybe you've lost your job. 
Perhaps you're just barely hanging on after four months of quarantining and all of the situations and circumstances that have surrounded COVID. Perhaps you feel like you're in a wilderness place given what's happening in our country with racial unrest and continued racial injustice. You're trying to figure out where you fit in in all of that and you have no idea where you fit in. It seems like it's toxic to say anything and it's toxic to say nothing and you're paralyzed. Perhaps you're in a wilderness place of anxiety and depression where the rates of which have skyrocketed and at our all-time high right now. I don't know where you are, but I do know that God works in all things to restore us. The entire biblical narrative, you could call it a redemptive song, is marching toward and on a road of restoration. Beginning in Genesis, God begins to restore all things to his correct and divine order. And we know it won't be fully realized until Christ returns and shouts the holy hooty hoo from the heavens and he cracks the sky like an eggshell and he says, hey, you, my people, my bride, I'm coming to get you. We know it won't be done until then, but we're all walking a road of restoration. But sometimes these wilderness experiences feel like we aren't loved or cared for by God. This evening, I'd like to preach a sermon entitled, Restoration Through Renovation. Restoration Through through renovation. My wife has a really unhealthy love for Chip and Joanna Gaines. (laughs) To the point where every day she comes home from Target with something new from the hearth and home line. Like, babe, what we we doing here, all right? What we doing here? Like, I I get, like, some of their stuff is good, but, like, legit, stop buying Chip Lab. Like, for real, you buy another throw pillow, I'm going to throw you. Not really, because, you know what I'm saying, I ain't trying to catch a case. But my wife spends so much money at Target buying stuff from Chip and Joanna Gaines' line. These two people have made an empire. They've built literally a retail empire off of renovating and rehabbing houses. Jeremiah 31 is so interesting to me because God is in the middle, uh, or actually he's beginning a restorative process for them that for the last 30 chapters, he has been telling them, Jeremiah, I need you to go and preach to all these people, your mama, your cousin, them, your play cousins, your aunties, your uncles, tell everybody's boss and all their friends, if you do not turn your face back to God to be faithful to the things that God has called you to, if you do not tear down the idols in your life, if you do not stop worshiping at altars that you don't belong at, I'm going to send you into exile. And at every single turn, the Israelites look at God with the same disinterested look that Adam and Eve gave him in the garden. I know you said that, but we don't care. So what does he do in Genesis 3? He expels them from the garden. He breaks the relationship with them, and now they're out of relationship, and they're out of their land. For 30 chapters, God is like, y'all need to get your act together. Now, I don't know what it was like for you in your house, but whenever my mother said, you need to get your act together, it meant you about to catch a whooping, so I would straighten up if I were you. For 30 chapters, God is saying this, and Jeremiah, he he doesn't like this. At several points, he's like, God, what's the point of this? They're not listening. These stiff-necked people, at one point, he says, God, I don't want to preach this anymore, but I feel like I can't not preach it. It's like a fire shut up in my bones. It's not fair. So a chapter earlier, God says, you didn't listen, so I'm breaking my fellowship with you, and I'm sending you out of this land to wander in the wilderness. 
But Jeremiah 31 stands as a testament of hope for us because here, even in the wilderness, look in verse 2, even in the wilderness, God looking back at the previous exodus of the Israelites out of Egypt into the promised lands, into Canaan, now they're experiencing a second exodus, and God reminds them that the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Here's my first piece of encouragement to you. If you're in the wilderness, if you're wandering in a desert place, if you're wandering in uncertainty, questioning God's care or provision for you, I need you to know that in the wilderness that there is grace. If you've survived the sword of life, and look, life is coming a million miles an hour trying to kill all of us. If you've survived to this point, there is still grace for you. Just as the Israelites were in a season of transition out of Egypt into Canaan, so to here are they in a season of transition. As Nebuchadnezzar is marching into and laying siege to Jerusalem in the southern kingdom from which Jeremiah is prophesying, God is saying, they survived then, I've got grace for you in the wilderness. I like what he goes on to say next because he's got to couch his grace in something stronger. It's one thing for God to say, I have grace for you, but we need to understand why. And the why comes in verse 3. The Lord appeared to him from far away and said, I have loved you with an everlasting love and I have continued my covenant faithfulness to you. Now, the word there for love, I need you to repeat after me, say chesed. One more time. Uh, if you've got a mask, you might want to put it on because we've got a whole lot of spittle and, um, and particles that might be flying in there. It, it, it's the word chesed. It's the Hebrew word for covenant loyalty and faithfulness. We don't really know how to translate this one-to-one from Hebrew to English. Just know this. It refers to God's unflinching, unending, unearned love, covenant, kindness to you. So the Israelites are tripping. I mean, absolutely tripping. They have broken the covenant that God set with them at Sinai, which says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. They couldn't even obey the first commandment. And now God is saying to them, even through all of that, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have continued my faithfulness to you. And then in verse 4, he gives them a promise that I want to spend a little time on here. He says, again, I will rebuild you, and again, you shall be built. Now here, here's where there's some gold. Because what God is referring to, think about this. He's speaking to a people in war, a people who can see the enemy from their front porch, a people who knows that death awaits them in exile, a people who knows that God is going to cut off his covenant relationship with them, that they are going to be removed from their homeland. He says, again, I shall rebuild you, and again, you shall be built. There's the hope that there will be a rebuilding process. Praise God for that. But what God points to here is actually something far worse and far better. What God is talking about here is renovation. Now, when Chip and Joanna go into a house, they walk into a house, and it's like, ugh, I don't even like this house. That wall shouldn't be here. Actually, I'm speaking as if my wife, her favorite thing is to go drive around and look at houses, hashtag white people. I don't get it. But we go around, and we look at all these houses House to house, and she's on Zillow, and she's on Redfin, and, and, she, and she's on Realtor, and she's on Trulia. And I'm like, uh, uh, babe, what's up? She's like, hey, look at this house. You see this wall? That shouldn't be there. You see that light fixture? That shouldn't be there. You see this bathroom? We could blow out that wall, and we could add these fixtures, and we can get this from Ikea. And the whole time I'm like, just buy another house. <laughs> if you don't like the house like it is, go find one that you do. But even then, she finds something wrong with it because what's on my wife's mind, she's always trying to renovate. And I don't know if you've ever renovated something. Pastor Chris was talking about renovating his kitchen. And if you've renovated anything, you know that in order to renovate something, you've got to 
destroy it. I mean, sledgehammers, you got your gloves on, you ripping up counters, and you got crowbars, and you're ripping up tile, and you're smashing studs and walls. Don't let me do that. I'm bound to electrocute you and myself at the same time. But when it comes to renovation, in order for something to be renovated, to be elevated to a more beautiful level, it first has to be deconstructed. What is the wilderness experience for the Israelites? It is God saying, I need a whole generation of y'all to die off so that the new product might be one who can serve me in full. What is God saying to the Israelites here about to go into exile? He's saying, I need all of you stiff-necked folks to die so that I can destroy, so that I can demolish, so that I can break you down and build up a people for my name so that through you, you might actually be what I want you to be, which is a nation, a kingdom of priests an example to the world, a city on a hill. I need that from you, but before we do that, I've got to throw you in exile to tear all this stuff out of you. Your wilderness season, your wilderness wandering can feel like punishment, and it can feel like God doesn't believe in you and that he doesn't love you. But what it actually is, is God weaning you off of the lower pleasures of this world to reveal to you the surpassing greatness and grandeur of knowing him. When Israelites come out of exile, you, you see this in Ezra and you see this in, in Nehemiah. When they come back to rebuild the walls of the city, they uncover the book of the law. And y'all, it is weeping. It is joy. And it is a people whose hearts are consecrated to the things of God. And just so you know how good this is, in verse 6, he says, For the watchmen, for there shall be a day when the watchmen will call in the hill country of Ephraim, southern kingdom, over toward the Red Sea, that they'll call from the hills. These men who sit on these hills and look for the enemy, they're actually going to be saying, Arise, let us go to Zion, to the Lord our God. They're actually going to be repurposed from wartime watchmen to peacetime proclaimers. God is repurposing their worship from being those during wartime who says the enemy is coming, the enemy is coming, the enemy is coming, to now their worship leaders on the hill saying, let's go see God, let's go to the house of God, let's go be with God. What God does in the wilderness and the rebuilding, this renovation that he's doing, once you go through a renovation and God transforms you, you won't be able to do the things that you used to do. There will no longer be a reason or a need for it. Your heart is in a different place. Your mind is in a different place. God in Christ is elevating you to another level of trust and dependence. Friends, coming out of quarantine, don't go back to the place where you lived in your own strength. Don't go back to the place where you trusted in your own skills or your money or your ability or your looks or your family to be your all in all. No, we must sing, great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of changing with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be, which means that he is a God who cares deeply that we know him and serve him. When you go through a renovation, you can't be what you used to be. It would be like Chip and Joanna going in to renovate a house, and then, you know, they got those, uh, the fake house, the picture of the house on the wheels, and they wheel it back, and they're like, surprise, and then the people on the show are like, they all act the same way, like, the guy's like, wow, and the wife's like, oh, my God, this is amazing, right? It would be like them, like, rolling the things back in the front, going into the house, taking a sledgehammer to a perfectly renovated house and starting over again. That's foolish. But this is the endeavor for every Christian trying to please God in their own strength. If you still believe your performance makes you right with God, you are taking a sledgehammer to a renovated house. And if you feel like you can curry God's love by what you do, you're still taking a sledgehammer to a renovated house. This is why God gives us verses 31 through 34. In the picture of a new covenant, I want you to look at it with me. Uh, look in verse 33. God says, I will put my law in them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. Here's what he's saying. 
You can't keep the law of God perfectly. It's why my first covenant failed, because they could not keep the law of God perfectly. But I am going to put this in your heart. But more than anything, God says in verse 34, for I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. Now, how is God going to do that? God, that's a whole lot of big words. That's a whole lot of promises. But how are you actually going to do this? You know the human heart. One of the most beautiful miracles is that God knows the nature and the fabric and the contents of our heart, and he allows us to live. So, so how is God going to accomplish this new covenant? Because this new covenant will also be based on works. It will also be based on perfection. It will also be based on obedience. This new covenant will have everything to do with us as humans obeying the law of God perfectly. The problem is that a covenant, this covenant, built on works. It is built completely and totally on works and perfection, just not yours. It is built on the works and the perfections of Christ Jesus, who I wonder if you remember that night in that upper room when Jesus is having supper, the Passover meal, with his homies. And he takes the bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body. Every time you eat, do so in remembrance of me. So they go num num and on some Jesus, a.k.a. bread. Then he takes the wine, and he says, this is the blood of what? My new covenant with you. The book of Hebrews says this even better. The book of Hebrews says that the blood of bulls and goats was never sufficient to atone for sin, but Christ himself offered himself as a sacrifice once and for all, which means that if we are in Christ, then we receive all of the benefits of God's covenant faithfulness and none of the consequences. Now, where I'm from, folks would have been shouting. That's all right. I understand why people listen to sermons a little bit different. So a hmm is really, praise God, hallelujah. I'm with you. (laughs) But here's what this means. Here's what this means. There's hope in the wilderness because God is in the wilderness. Even in the wilderness of sin, S-I-N, capital S, literally the name of the wilderness that Israel wandered in, God gave them a pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day, and a tabernacle to remember that God is with us. And in your current wilderness, God gives you reminders of the the God-man, God in Christ, through the Holy Spirit who is with you, holding your hand the whole time, telling you, again, I will build you, and again, you shall be built. Here's the key. Here's what I'm trying to get at. For all of those uh, in the wilderness, for all of those going through restoration, here's the truth. In the wilderness, cling to the promise of renovation. It will hurt, but it's worth it. If you don't remember anything else from what I've got to say today, in the wilderness, cling to the promise of renovation. It will hurt, but it's worth it. There was a man named Jesus who consumed and took upon himself the sin of all of humanity, not just yours, and that's a gang of sin. Not just your neighbors, that's a gang of sin. Not just the sins of this room, but the sins of all humanity throughout all of time. That God placed his wrath on Christ Jesus. He sent Jesus into exile to suffer and die alone. He sent Jesus into a place where his fellowship was broken. He sent Jesus into a place for you and I to receive the punishment so that we might receive God's chesed. So here's what this means. I got 24 seconds. Here's what this means. If this is true of you, if you are a new covenant believer, you've got to stop referring to yourself as a sinner. You are not a sinner. You're a son and a daughter. If this is true of you, you've got to stop throwing pity parties because of your sin. Them things ain't kosher. Because in Christ, we are forgiven. Verse 34, I will remove their sin and their iniquity far from them. Here's also what this means. Friends in the wilderness, stop doubting God's care because even the wilderness is purposeful to renovate you into where he wants you to be, which is a deeper level of reflection for Christ-likeness. Ain't enough shiplap that can externally and superficially transform us. No, this renovation is an inside-out, bone-deep renovation. And the product, the product 
of that renovation is a worshiper who attributes and owes everything, even their very lives, to the God who did the impossible by making dry bones live. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I do thank you for your word, and I thank you that this process that has begun in me and many of us, that you would see it through to the end. And then I pray that the, the truth that you who began a good work in us will see it to completion. Father, for those of us who are in the wilderness who may be doubting your care or your nearness, would you make yourself ever available and present and close? And Jesus, I pray that as you are the embodiment, you are the personified embodiment of the Father's covenant faithfulness, would you remind us of that? And would you lead us confidently to your throne, knowing that there we'll receive grace and mercy? So Lord, would you continue to make your word come alive in us? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's people say it.